to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and starting at verse 9, and let's all stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to switch the cord list here. Matthew, chapter 6, starting at verse 19. Say amen when you have it, or when the screen has it. (laughs) All right, verse 19. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, There will your heart be also. If you would lift your voices with me and we will pray. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this service and for what you're doing in it. God, we thank you for this the presence that we feel in this place, oh God, and we ask, Lord, that you would remove every distraction right now, oh God, and anoint your servant, anoint every ear to hear, oh God, and let us hear your word and apply it to our lives, oh God. We long for more of you, God, and we ask that you would not disappoint us, oh God, tonight, but we expect, Lord, to receive from you, and we'll give you praise, and we'll give you glory for it, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in that wonderful name, amen. And you may all be seated. So tonight, I just want to speak on a, uh, for a few minutes on only one life. How many only has one life? Cats, they say, have nine lives, but we, are not, we only have one. And so that's what I want to speak on tonight. And I have another question. How many people know someone who considers himself to be an atheist? I can name several. I work with them. I know many from school and from other places that claim to believe that they're is no God. And I don't know down deep down in their heart. All I know is that they say and they they will protest with all of their being that there is not a God. And I personally have seen way too much to even consider that. But they adamantly refuse to acknowledge the concept of God and say that there is there is no God. All across North America you'll find people like this. But it's a very foreign concept. If you go into every culture, um, in every period of time in the earth, there has always been a belief in a God. The Muslims believe in Allah. The Christians and the Jews believe in the one true God, Jesus Christ, or the Jews, Jehovah, at least. And the, even the ancient Greek cultures, the Roman cultures, they had their mythologies. They had their ideas of creation. The Nathan, Na- Native Americans have their great spirit, and they have their gods of the sky and gods of the earth. But in all these different cultures, we see this. And only in a very materialistic culture will you find the concept that there is no God. Where there is not this materialism, you won't find that. You'll find that they always believe in a God, whether that is the one true God or not. And uh, I'm glad that I do know the one true God. (laughs) I'm very thankful for that. The Bible says that the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And I'm so thankful that he has revealed himself to us. But the same majority, worldwide, goes for believing in an afterlife. All of those cultures that I mentioned believe in something to come, that this life is not, does not stand alone, that when we die, that's not the end, that there's nothing after that. All of those cultures also believe that there is a heaven or there is a whatever their particular name might be for. And there's one in particular that I want to focus on tonight. And so, Timmy, if you want to bring up that picture... I want to share a little bit about ancient Egyptians. And the first thing that we think of when we think of Egypt is the pyramids. Um, So I have a picture. This is Khufu's pyramid. I don't know exactly how to say it, but it's one of the largest pyramids and one great pyramids wonders of the world. And what these pyramids were were for was to preserve the body so that and all of its belongings to take it into the afterlife. And they went great lengths to protect that. So this here has over 2.5 million stones in that building right there. The average of those stones is over two tons in weight. And some of the biggest ones are even over 150 tons in weight. These would have taken years and years of labor. They were built with extreme patience. And these were not necessarily built as monuments of, to show their wealth or to show their prestige. But the reason that these were built was because they were preparing for an afterlife. Inside the tomb, there were placed statues 
so that after his death, he wouldn't have to work. All these statues to come to life and work for him. They would build elaborate coffins and put their symbols and their whatever all that stuff meant on, this, on the statue. And even during their life, they believed that they had to do more good works than bad works so that once they got to the afterlife, their heart would be lighter than a feather. And this, this was all of in, their, in their belief system. But for this to happen, their body had to be preserved. So we all know about the, mummy, the mummies. Their bodies had to be mummified so that they could be taken into the afterlife. And the wealthy, they commissioned furniture and jewelry. Anything that they wanted to take with them, they would have it commissioned for them and then taken into that tomb, sealed off, and many passages built within that so that no robbers could get in during they, while they were in the afterlife. But their whole life was spent not looking at this life, but looking ahead at the next. If they were wealthy, it wasn't, oh, how much wealth can I collect in this life? It's how much can I take to the next? And, of course, we know that their, the afterlife is not quite like they thought it was. We don't necessarily believe in their mythology, at least I hope not. But I'm inspired by their belief how it wasn't just words, but it was actions. Everything that they did was pointed ahead to what was to come after. And they just saw death or whatever as an interruption, a brief moment, and then just life continued. They didn't see it as an end. So if you can take that picture down now. Um, but I'm just inspired by that. And we love to talk about how fast time flies and how short this life is, and how there's not enough hours in the day, but then how does it affect our day-to-day -day actions? And what are we doing to prepare for eternity? So that's um, what I want to talk about tonight. How many want to go to heaven? I hope everyone raises their hand. I really do. Otherwise, why are you here? But I hope we all want to go to heaven. But what do we know about heaven? We don't know all the details that we'd like to know. The Bible says a lot, but not enough that we have this complete image in our mind of what it looks like. There's a lot of questions. That when I get up there, I'm going to be looking around, and there's going to be a lot that I did not know. And uh, there's talks about streets of gold and all this, and, and I'm like, streets of gold? Like, what's, what's the point of that? Like, I have so many questions I don't even understand. But the Bible tells us enough that I'm excited. We know that it's a real place and that it's a place where God's children go. It's where God's throne is. That enough should be exciting. All tears are going to be wiped away. There's no hunger, no thirst, no death, no dying, no pain, no crying, no night. There's no more curse. There's, and my personal favorite, no more stress. <laughs> I, uh, I get easily stressed out. So I'm looking forward to the day where I can just lay that all down and Jesus just takes care of it all. But uh, infinite joy, eternal joy, I'm, count me in for that. I'm, I'm up for that. And it's a lot better than the afterlife that the Egyptians look, were looking forward to. That's, um, theirs wasn't quite as a, a perfect place. But as Christians, if we believe that heaven is real, then we need to be getting excited for eternity. And we need to fall in love with the idea of heaven. See, as a young person, uh, and I think a lot of young people have the same kind of struggle, or maybe it's not just young people, I don't know. But it's so easy to think, before Jesus comes, I want to get this done. I want to get this done and I have to do this, and I just want to experience life a little, and, and we have this list, and, and uh, it's kind of like, Jesus, I want you to come, but just not, not yet, okay? <laughs> but uh, if we could just catch a hold of the idea that we're strangers in the land, and the more that we realize how awesome heaven is, the more we'll want to go. And the closer we get to Jesus, it kind of seems to be the same sort of thing. Like, the more that we fall in love with Jesus, the more we're excited to see him face to face. And everything else just kind of fades off into the distance because I can't wait to go to heaven. And if we could just, we're strangers. This isn't our home. We're just kind of in a hotel here waiting to go home. And uh, one day we're going to go to heaven. And that should be our hope. That's what carries us through. Second Timothy 4 and 8. If we could have that brought up on the screen. 2 Timothy 4 and 8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. This is Paul speaking. And he also continues. He says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, speaking to Timothy. And then he says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians unto Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatian. So we... 
find in just a couple verses, he's talking about his excitement to go to heaven and how he can't wait, how he loves the appearing. He loves the idea of Jesus coming back, and he can't wait for that day. A couple verses later, he says, Demas has left me because he loved this present world. And someone, when they're preaching, I think it was Kent, but I can't be sure, pointed out this, and I, I've never forgot it, how that Paul loved the world to come, and Demas loved this world. And when I look at that verse, I want to be the one, like Paul, who loves the world to come, because I don't want to leave everything behind and then regret it later, but I want to love his appearing. And that should be our hope, our joy, our driving force. And Demas was so focused on now that he forgot that this life is only a short part of what is to come. And I want to, when, when Jesus comes back or whatever may come first, whether it's death or Jesus coming back, I want to spend every moment that I have of this life getting ready for heaven. I don't want to spend it waiting. I don't want to spend it wasting time doing just the day-to-day -day living. Although, yeah, we have to do that, but I don't want that to be all. I don't want to spend it around just sitting in a church or whatever and waiting for my lottery ticket to get into heaven because um, people don't win lotteries. Um, they might, but it's not going to be you. <laughs> Um, so I don't want to take a chance on that, trying to get into heaven. I, I, I don't want to do that. If you were to store up treasures here on earth, you, it's not going to be through just waiting and wishing for it to happen. You're going you're gonna to start out there, and you're going to start earning the money, and you're just going to start earning the treasures. And it's, there's a process that you have to go through to become rich. I don't know that process, but there is a process. And I guess... We could kind of, we could take that over into the spiritual and say that there's, you know, we have to earn our salvation. But the Bible speaks against that. We don't earn our salvation. So is my an analogy falling apart? No, because Christ already paid for it. We don't have to earn it because, yes, there was a process to go through, and Christ already did that when he came and he died on the cross, and now salvation is given to us. So then what qualifies, or he's, so how does that transfer to us? We inherit his wealth. We inherit what he already paid for. So then I come to the question, well, what qualifies one for an inheritance? And normally, that is being a part of the family. Normally, the wealth of a, of a mother or father is left to the children or direct, direct descendants anyway. And so to inherit what God has already done for us, his salvation, all we have to do is become part of his family. And how, and how do we do that? Take on the family name. That's why we're baptized in Jesus' name. The Bible says, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. We know. We sung about it tonight. Jesus is the saving name. He's the strong tower. He's our safety. And that's why we're baptized in Jesus' name. And there's no other way. It's because in him is salvation. And why would we want any other name or any other method when it's all in Jesus? And that's he's all that we need. So to join the family of God, we take on his family name. We're baptized into Christ, into his death. And then we all know what comes next. <laughs> we get the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of in our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. The Holy Ghost is our promise and our reminder that we're going to be in heaven someday. If we've been baptized into his name and we are part of the family of God, that Holy Ghost is our promise that heaven's going to be for us, that we're going to be up there someday praising him. Every single day, that Holy Ghost inside of us. Every time we speak in tongues, every time we magnify God and we feel that Holy Ghost within us, we know that it's there. We say, I'm going to see Jesus one day. I'm going to see Jesus one day. And that's our promise. That's our promise. I want to I wanna have the Holy Ghost. I want to be full of it. I want to be ready when he comes. Do you realize how short this life is? <laughs> I, people always talk about how fast time goes. And, uh, yeah, I want to be ready, but we don't have much time to get ready. We have our obligations. We have to eat. We have to sleep, um, work. We have jobs. We have families. We have dreams, things that we want to see accomplished. And uh, we tend to keep church 
and our relationship with God separate from all of those things. You know, those are things of the flesh. Those are things that just have to be done. This is spiritual things. It's on another plane kind of thing. But if you think about how limited our time here on earth is, we can't afford to separate separate those things. And I've seen this rope illustration done. I think a Bible school student might have done it here once. But they d- take a long rope and they tie a knot in just one part of the rope. And it's a very long rope. And they s- say, look at this knot, like how small it is into the context of the grand thing. I didn't do it uh, here tonight, but you can envision envision it in your mind and that little part of the rope is just what this life is and the rest of it is all of eternity and even the bible uses so many comparisons to show how life how short life is it's but a vapor you know appears for a time and then vanisheth away it talks about how it's like the grass and the flowers that wither away it's a, sh- a shadow it's, it's here and then it's gone it's just a story. It's a wind that passes by. And it does to name a few. It also says it's like a weaver shuttle. A weaver shuttle can do one rotation per second. Not very much. And that's how short of a period we have to get ready for heaven. But it's a gift from God, that opportunity that we have to decide where we're going to spend eternity. And to, I think that we need to take that gift of God and be good stewards of it. Stewardship is a biblical principle we see it it talks the bible talks a lot about money it talks about stewardship of our money even in proverbs it talks about like you know just normal stuff spending money and and not to waste and to work that a man should work and just all this stuff and but it's not just stewardship of money that's just a small part of it it's also god blesses with us with family we're to care for them we're to love them god blesses us with talents we're to use them for his kingdom and not waste them there's a lot of things that can be under this branch. And another thing that God gives to us is time. Time is a gift from God. He created it. And if it's a gift, do we have the right to waste it all? Do we have the right to spend all of our time on meaningless pursuits before we've given any time to him? Solomon had everything that he could have ever wanted in his life. He was the wisest man that ever lived. He was rich beyond measure. All the kings and queens of, this, of the world at that time looked to him. And he had the status and everything that he ever could have wanted. In the end of his life, book of Ecclesiastes, he said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. The book lists all these things that Solomon had tried. Read it. It's there. He tried education. He tried work. He tried seeking wisdom, pleasure. He tried wine. He tried building projects. He tried planting gardens, having servants, possessions, getting rich, listening to music. It's in there eating and drinking, gaining power. In the end, he said, it's, it's all vanity. It's all going to be over. All the little things that we get caught up in wanting to make ourselves known or make our life comfortable, in the end, it's all, it's all going to be vanity because we're going to realize how short this little life is in comparison of all the life that we still have let to live in eternity. Solomon did credit honest work. He said that a man should be content to work and to eat and to drink and, and to be merry. And he wasn't against the day-to-day of living. But at the end of his life, he said it was all, all meaningless and it was empty if he hadn't put, if, without God first. He said the whole duty of man was to fear God and to keep his commandments. And he, what he realized is that you can't take wealth and power with you. You can't take anything with you to heaven. The Egyptians didn't realize that. They tried to take, you know, they tried to take servants and, and, and wealth and jewelry and furniture and all that stuff, but that stuff doesn't go with you after this life is over. Perhaps some of you have played it. There's a game that children play, or um, and it's, I'm going camping, and I'm going to take an apple. Next person, I'm going camping, and I'm going to take a balloon. I don't know. But they name all this stuff, every letter of the alphabet, and we've actually done it in power, I think, before where we, we changed it up, and we said, I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to take, and you fill in the blank. But the only thing is, there's not a whole lot of words you can fill in that blank. You can't take the apple and the balloon. You can't take things of this world. There's only one thing that actually fits in that blank, and that's names. You can say, I'm going to take my family. I'm going to take my friends. And that's the only thing, the only word that will fit in there. And so that we, we have so little time to to witness to them, to tell them about heaven, to tell them about 
eternity and to tell them about how that they can come to heaven with us. We have to take advantage of every single opportunity that we're given. Ephesians 5 and verse 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeem in that verse means to buy up time or to buy up opportunities. Other translations that kind of paraphrase it say to make the most of the time that we have. We are to take advantage of every opportunity that is given to us by God because the days are evil and we have to be the light that's shining for him. We have to be the ones that will stand and say, I know Jesus, I know the way to heaven, please let me show you. And I've often thought about, back to being good stewards of our time, I've often thought about time tithing. I'm not shame, saying that I do this. But I've just thought about it. We have 24 hours in the day. Let's say we spend, let's say, eight hours of it sleeping. That still leaves us with 16. A tenth of that would be 1.6 hours. And I've just thought about, well, what if we spent that much time with God? It's not so foreign. We do it with our money. We give a tenth to God. Or at least we should be. But keeping this time tithe in mind, I'm thinking, like, 1.6 hours, and we like, oh, I don't want to get up for church this morning. Right, right, do we, do we have to begrudge God some of our time, so little bit of our time, even with those four services a week, say two services on Sunday, one on Tuesday, and Saturday night prayer, even after that, and I did the math, it's only still about an hour, it still only brings it down to about an hour a day, besides church, that belongs to God, if you did the time tithing. So I'm just throwing that out there as food for thought, I'm not saying you have to spend an hour a day exactly, but I'm just saying, what if with our time we're robbing God? What if with neglecting him out of our day and out of our week, we're actually doing the same thing as it says in Malachi that we do when we don't give the tithe to God. We're robbing him. We're withholding something from him that belongs to him. And it doesn't make sense that we would do that when we think about how short life is and the whole purpose of life is to prepare for the next one. It doesn't make sense that we would spend so little of it on what's actually going to matter in the end. Because this life's just a blip in the in the timeline of eternity, and yet it carries so much weight because it determines the rest of it. So I, I want to do what that verse says and redeem the time and make the most of every opportunity I have to lay up treasures in heaven. So I am coming to a close soon. I haven't been too long, I don't think. Um, but there's a little illustration I found. I did find it online. It's not original to me, but uh, I liked it. And it says, the Bible often compares people to sheep. We know that. It talks about Jesus being the good shepherd and how we're the sheep. But after watching them for a while, they kind of just wander around. You know, they wander this clump of grass. They eat that up. Then they'll kind of wander over here and eat this one. You know, that one looks yummy. And they just wander around. They don't have any kind of direction. And if there wasn't a shepherd there, they would just wander off, living, you know, living for the next clump of grass, they just kind of wander off, and who knows where they'd go, they could go right into the face of danger, and that's why the shepherd's there to kind of, and the sheepdog usually too, to corral them back, and without that shepherd, they'd have no sense of direction at all in their life, they just kind of wander from one clump of grass to the next, they live for the moment, and it's very understandable why God would compare his church to sheep, or people to sheep when we think about that, because we live for the moment, it's what we do, it, like, it's our nature to just, you know, the next thing in our life, the next goal in our life. For me, it was, you know, to graduate high school, and then if I can just, you know, get the summer, and then, oh, I'm going to one year to Bible school. After Bible school is done, and, and, you know, just getting that next milestone done, and now I'm just working, and, you know, and waiting for that season to end. But even, we just kind of mark milestones and live from one, one stage to the next, or one moment to the next. And that's how the world lives. They just, what benefits them in the moment, whatever feels good at the moment. But any wise businessman will tell you that you need to think long term. And as a Christian, I want to think even longer term than what they mean, because long term should include eternity. <laughs> Colossians 3 verse 2 says, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. And what if we did that? Every single day we woke up and said, Lord, I'm going to live this day for you. And I can't wait to see you soon. And that's why I'm living today is because one day I'm going to get to see you. 
Philippians 1.21 carries along the same line. It says, this is Paul again speaking. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, meaning just this, this mortal body, what we do day to day, it's the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul was torn between two worlds. He had a work to do on this one. He was reaching people for God, and yet he wanted to go home. And he was torn between these two worlds. And we should kind of be experiencing the same thing. I want to, I want to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus. But at the same time, I want to stay here a little bit longer so I can take as many people as possible with them. And so God knows best. He knows when he's going to come back. But I'm kind of torn between the two because I want to, I want to finish my work here on earth. I want to see people saved. And I want to go home and see Jesus. But Paul's motto was to live as Christ and to die as gain. And if anything else substitutes in there where Christ is, then the last part of it doesn't hold true. Because if we say to live is money or it's family or ambition or, I don't know, anything that you could fill in the blank there, then to die or to the end one's life would be, it would be loss. But because to live is Christ, it didn't matter whether he lived or died. It didn't matter whether he was stuck here on earth or Jesus came back soon because it was gain. It was gain. He got to see Jesus, and he was looking forward to that. So I look at that, and I question myself, what's my reason for living? Could I say that every day, to live is Christ? And if Jesus comes, I'm ready to go. There's a song that Lanny, the song by the Lanny Wolf Trio that they wrote. And the chorus of it says, only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one chance to do his will. So give to Jesus all your days. It's the only life that pays when you recall that you have but one life. And if Brother Trail could come back to the piano. That song's so true. We only have one life to get it right. We only have one chance to be ready for all of eternity. After that, there's no chance to change our minds. We have no time to waste. And our world is dying. And this is our one chance to see them saved, to see them baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And living for him, it's our one chance. And so because of that, I want to be redeeming the time, taking advantage of every opportunity that I have to be praying, to be serving, to be bringing people into the doors of the church and laying up treasures in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for heaven. But while I'm here on this earth, I want to live every single day for Christ, to live as Christ. So if we could all come around this altar and pray and just let it sink in. I hope somebody else is excited about heaven. I want to be ready, and I want to be laying up treasures over there and not here.